Hi, grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 4 as we look at the story of the woman at the well. Hi, I'm Nathan Pearl. Welcome to the Contend for Your Faith Bible Study series. We have with us tonight Greg Roseboom, out from Virginia. And running the show, we have Jarrett behind the cameras. All right, tonight we're going to be getting into John chapter 4. There's some really neat things we're going to look at, but before we do that, we have a, a little segment here of news of things that are happening around the nation that Greg's going to bring us. So go ahead, Greg. What do we have in the news this week? I don't, I don't have too much news, but um, a, a bit of sad news, and that is that the uh, Navy chaplains this week were told that they were going to have to start performing same-sex marriages on naval bases around the country, and they were told to uh, go ahead and start preparations uh, to do that. So um, that's just a bit of bad news. Um, some interesting news out of Oxford University. Oxford is uh, one of the foremost universities in the world. It's the second oldest university behind uh, the University of Paris. And um, Oxford started off with religious roots. And for the last few years, they've been doing a study. And the study has included many, many academics. And the, and the title of the study that they've been doing uh, was this. It was Cognition, Cognition, Religion, and Theology Project. And the aim of the project was to figure out if the belief in God was something learned by people or if it was something that every human being had already inside of them. They already had the belief inside of them from birth. So they went out and did the study all over the world and they've been working on the study for many years and they finally came out with their results this week and the results were that Oxford University says uh, that people are born with an understanding of God. They are, they're born with, they, they know that God exists. They know that there's an afterlife was another part of the study, which is very interesting. And so after doing this massive study, they came to the conclusion uh, that we already came to, because we have the word of God, <laughs> we already know the conclusion that they came to, and that was that, uh, that people already are born with, with an understanding that there is a creator and there is an afterlife. Part of the reason this is really interesting to me is there is a common liberal belief that religion is only in human beings because it's been taught. Years ago, I was speaking with a relative of mine, and I told him that I was doing some mission work. And the relative said, what are you doing that for? He said, well, why are you going over there and trying to push your way of life upon people in other countries? Why don't you just let them live the way they want to live? And if they were born without God, let them be that way. And my, my relative's belief was that everyone is just born in whatever society they're born in, and they're influenced only but by society. So if you're born into a culture of religion, then the reason you believe in religion is because you were born into that culture and you've been influenced by your culture. And that's a very common belief to believe that. So this study by Oxford, and of course a lot of what Oxford puts out is just a bunch of academics trying to, to, to um, you know, sound, sound great and they're full of pride. But it's interesting that they came to, they, they found the truth in, in their study. So that's all the news I had to share for tonight. Hmm. That is, uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, that they did all that study to find out something that is that is true, and it seems like the more we uh, the we, more we study it, a lot of times in order to disprove it, the more we prove that that God knows what He's talking about and started the this this whole thing knowing what He's talking about. And uh, it says in Romans, having professed themselves to become wise, to be wise, they've become fools, and said in their heart, "There is no God." The uh, there, there's a progression that as people gain 
insight and knowledge, they get puffed up by that knowledge and then get to the point to where they say our knowledge is greater than the being that created us, so much so that we are our own creators. We are our own uh, deity to ourselves. And you see that grow in the, the next the next stage of that progression, and I've seen that um, with people I know, the next stage in that progression is uh, a loss of natural affections. They, they lose normal natural affections, and they have affections for trees. They say that, that trees are more important than people, or they have affection for animals, and say that, that we shouldn't eat meat, we should, shouldn't kill animals because they're as important as we are. They have uh, uh, affection for the same sex. They get into homosexuality, um, and strange, strange things that aren't natural. And you go, well, how could that happen? It starts by not, it's by misunderstanding your place in the universe and how you relate to God, how you relate to other people. And, and it, it, without that anchor and foundation in the fact that God created us and we're responsible to him, um, there is no uh, foundation. And that's why we have that progression in Romans that, that they professed themselves to be wise, they became fools, they worshiped not God, but worshiped things, other things, they lost natural affection, and then men working with men and women with women, that which was inconvenient. It's the, uh, it's, it's the progression, and unfortunately, I, I've seen it. I've seen people get into philosophy and, and, uh, in, in education, uh, in reading. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with philosophy or education. I enjoy both, but get into that uh, and supplant God in their lives with that understanding of philosophy to the point to where um, they would abandon God and then lose natural affection and all bearing and end up uh, off the deep end in homosexuality. Um, and... Uh, it's sad, but it's, it's something that happens again and again. All right. We, every week, we ask for emails, people to send us comments, questions. And recently, we've received some very encouraging, very uh, helpful um, emails. Uh, and it is, uh, it's wonderful to get those kinds of things to let us know what we're, what we're able to do here and how we're helping people. And this past week, I got an email that I thought was, I sat down to answer it and started going through um, some Bible verses and things, and I thought, you know, this is a, uh, this is a bigger uh, uh, question. It has more relevance, and it has relevance to what we're studying this week. I want to answer this thing online. I want to do it in a public forum so that other people can question themselves and consider, how would you answer this? This whole thing that we're doing is about contending for your faith. It's about how can you share your faith, how can you contend for your faith with people that don't understand it or that question it. Um, and so I thought this was a really good question. Um, now, I'm not going to, uh, to give any names or specifics, uh, but I'm going to give this question. It says, I was sharing some of my findings with my Catholic friends, and uh, we looked at some scripture about Mary. Uh, especially about Jeremiah 7:44, with the Queen of Heaven references. And she asked me about visions of Mary. I know several people who have been visited with visions of Mary and, and a feeling of overwhelming peace they've attributed to this, uh, this visit or this, this uh, uh, time of, of this being coming to them. Is this just the devil masquerading as an angel of light? Um, I know my Catholic friends would never conceive of that, no matter what the Bible says. How do you answer that question? How do you contend for your faith there? So let me ask you, put yourself in this position. You have a friend that comes to you and says, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic, and I am not going to uh, accept that Mary is just a human, because I've been visited by her, I've seen an apparition of her, and when she came, I had an overwhelming feeling of peace and serenity. Um, smelled honeysuckle, and, and there was purity and light, music and song. It was a beautiful time of fellowship. And, and, uh, and I know, because of my personal experience, that, that 
she loved me and cared for me and looked after me in this time. And this is not a priest telling you this. This is a friend of yours. This is a, a cousin, a, a, a brother, a sister. Uh, this is somebody that, that you want to reach out to and witness to. You want to bring them to the truth. And uh, so how do you do it? How do you talk to them scripturally? How do you talk to them uh, emotionally, psychologically? How do you connect with this person and effectively communicate the truth to uh, this, this lost individual? So I'm going to let Greg answer this first. And Greg and I haven't talked about this. Um, I shared the email with him. And Bob, who was going to be with us tonight, um, but uh, the uh, we haven't communicated about this because I thought it'd be interesting to to see a couple different perspectives. Hopefully, a couple different perspectives about how one might answer this question, how you would uh, um, effectively share your faith with somebody, and the reason that. Uh, I think this is important to see a couple different ways is because I don't think there's necessarily one way to do this. I think that this is where the Spirit of God will guide you into the direction that you need to wit. Now, I'm not saying that that's all you go by. You need to have the Word of Truth. You need to have studied it, understand it. You need to have references ready to go. But uh, ultimately, the the right answer, I, I believe, that God will can direct you to so that you can reach somebody, and that's when you get there prayed up. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Greg go first. Greg, go ahead and, and answer that, if you would. Uh, I got, I, I, you mentioned you sent me the email, and I actually didn't get a chance to open it up. So I don't know, um, all I know is what you just said about the email. But uh, it was interesting the way you just put it, Nate, because you said it, you know, depending on whether the person's a relative or a friend or, or what, what, you know, what, uh, what, who the person is and what their attitude is. And that's going to make so much of a difference in the way that I respond. Um, let me give you a little example. I was at Starbucks uh, and I was talking to a girl who, who was really hurting inside and sh I was telling her about Jesus and uh, a man on a wheelchair, he came up right next to me and sat at the table, sat at the table near me, but he was sitting right next to me. And he, it was obvious he was listening to my conversation. And, and so I kind of looked over at him because it was a little bit odd that he was sitting close to me and he was listening. And, and I looked over at him and smiled. And he said, how do you know Jesus is the only way? And... And I, and I said, well, Jesus said he's the only way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. And he said, well, there's so many religious books out there. You have the Bible. You have the Quran. You have all these. You, you, have, you, have, is, you, have, um, you, you, you have Hinduism. And, and he said, how do you know which book's the right book? And I, and I said to him, you know what? It, it seems like you want to argue with me. And... I'm not interested in arguing with you about this. If you really want to know more about Jesus, then I'll, I'll give you a track. But I'm not, I'm not really interested in talking to you right now about uh, uh, if you want to argue. And, and he said, you're not going to answer my question? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to answer your question. If you, want, if you want, I'll give you a Bible track. But I'm busy right now talking to this girl right here. And so, um, so if you want, I'll give you this track. And he said, I don't want to read your track. And I carried on my conversation with the girl I was talking to. Now, when I turned back to the girl, I started talking to her, and she had this shock look in her face. And, and then about a minute later, the guy in the wheelchair, he rolled, away, he rolled his wheelchair away. He, he was upset because I told him I didn't want to talk to him. And the girl next to me, she says, I can't believe you just did that. There was somebody who was trying to talk to you about God, and you told him you didn't want to talk to him. And I said, it's more important to me right now to sit here and tell you about Jesus because you want to hear about Jesus than it is to sit here and argue with somebody over which book is the right book. And you know what? She looked at me differently, and all of a sudden she was a lot more interested to hear what I had to say because she could see that this message was not something I was just going to throw out to whoever came by. 
it was something something that was precious and it was it was it was it was a message that I wanted to give to somebody who wanted to hear it. And Jesus, he responded so differently to people who came to him who wanted to be healed and who who came to him and said uh, they, they cried out, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Thou son of David, have mercy. And they cried out to Jesus. And Jesus came to them and he healed them and he said, Great is your faith. And he responded with compassion. But to those who came to him and they said, Who are you? Who, who, what authority do, do you do this by? Jesus would oftentimes respond, oftentimes respond with a rebuke. And, and often he wouldn't even give them the truth. He'd give them some leading, some, some, something they didn't understand. So, uh, you know, it, it, so much of this Catholic issue comes down to the person and whether they want to argue with me, whether they believe it so firmly or, or, or whether they really are truly interested in knowing the truth and they really want to know the scripture. Um, if it's a brother or a sister of mine, then it becomes a lot more sensitive because it's somebody who knows me very well. They know my life and they know if I'm different. And, and, and when it's a brother or sister or a close relative, it, it, it changes the way that I, that I, that I speak about, about these things. So with that said, I'm going to go to one of my favorite verses I go to when I talk to somebody who's bringing up the Virgin Mary and who wants to talk about how they pray to the Virgin Mary and how they got their beads out and they, they say over and over again, Hail Mary, the, you know, whatever they have to say. One of my favorite verses to go to is a verse in Luke chapter 11. And uh, the verse is found in verse 27. It says in Luke chapter 27, Jesus is in the middle of preaching to the people. And this, this person comes up to Jesus, says, And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which gave which thou get hast sucked now that woman was a catholic she's the the first catholic recorded because she yelled out in the middle of jesus message blessed is mary now, did Jesus agree with her? Did he say, amen, blessed is my mother? He, he didn't. He, he looked at her and he said, yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Now, that's an interesting response from Jesus to the Catholic. The Catholic says, blessed is the mother, blessed Mary. And Jesus said, uh, yea, rather. He said, no, 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 something else. Blessed, rather, is the person that hears the word of God and keeps it. So Jesus turned their eyes away from this person called Mary, and he, and he, and he turned their eyes to the person who hears the word of God and keeps it. So let's hear the word of God and keep it. And if we go through the word of God, we see constantly it is pointing to us praying to and worshiping our Heavenly Father. Who did Jesus pray to? He constantly prayed to, to, to His Heavenly Father. And, you know, with Catholics, a lot of times I'll just start sharing my testimony. And I'll start sharing what Jesus did in my life. And I found that whether I'm speaking to a Mormon or a Catholic or, or anyone who talks about Jesus, but they want to change things. And I start pointing to Jesus as the only way. And I start telling them about what Jesus did on the cross. And I start focusing my entire attention on what Jesus did for their sin and my sin and how he bled and how when they lied, when they've stolen, when they've looked at things that they felt guilty for looking at, Jesus, he, he, he took that lie that they did and he took that, that, that lustful thought. And he carried their sin upon himself, upon the cross, and he died for it. And I start telling them what Jesus did for them. You know what? They get uncomfortable. I've seen it happen so many times when I'm talking to somebody who talks about Jesus. And I just start focusing on, I mean, they talk about religion. 
And Jesus is included in their theology. But I start focusing on Jesus and focusing on what he did on the cross. I see him get uncomfortable and they want to change the subject and they want to start talking about Mary. And, they, and I just keep coming back to Jesus and, and, and they get uncomfortable with that. As far as the feeling goes and the vision of Mary, you know what? Muhammad had a vision of the prophet Gabriel. And it started a whole new religion. You know what? The, the Mormons have visions of the... the uh, what's his name had a vision of the... Um, uh, uh, Joseph Smith had a vision of the angel Gabriel. And it started a whole new religion. And, you know, the, the Mormons, every single Mormon that is truly a Mormon, you know what? They have a feeling inside of their stomach. You ask them. Ask them if they felt something inside of their stomach. When they, when they got converted to Mormonism. And they all tell you that. They say, you know about it? You know about the feeling? Oh, I felt it right inside of here. And it was the most amazing feeling I've ever felt. And that when I felt that feeling, I knew that it was real. So I've heard all about feelings of all these different religions. And, and the feelings, no matter how real the feeling felt. And how convincing the feeling felt. Or how convincing the angel Gabriel was that came to somebody. Or, or Mary was that came to you. You know what? It's in all the... These visions are in all the different religions. And these feelings are in all the religions. But there's something that, that is greater than a feeling. It's something that is true. And when you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. And you believe that when he died on the cross, he died for the sin of Mary. And Mary was a sinner who deserved hell and eternal damnation, just like you and me. And the only way that Mary was saved is by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, her son that died on the cross for her sin. When you believe that, then, then your life will change and you will be free from sin. All right. Get me excited here. <laughs> well, I, I thought it'd be cool to have two different perspectives. But uh, while Greg was talking, Jarrett was laughing at me because I'd talked to him about it this week, and that was the same answer I gave just about. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I've done before and that I ag agree with Greg on, and, and we're going to see Christ do that in chapter 4 here as, as we go through this, and that is that, uh, that we're going to ignore the straw man or the issue that's brought up that is um, irrelevant to the truth that's needed. The truth is, the, is Jesus. And if, if something's brought up as a distraction, rather than focus on the distraction and be distracted by it, we're going to turn our attention back to Christ, back to the thing that matters, and we're going to and look at it again and again and again. And um, it's effective. Now, the... Specifically, the email that we got, and it's something that I have I've dealt with a little bit before, and that is, it's, a, it's not a question of where you visited. It's not a question of, was this a, the devil or was it the Holy Spirit? Was it Mary or was it Beelzebub that, that uh, visited you and, and you had this feeling of peace and serenity? That's not the question. It's a question of authority. The question is, what is the authority of our relationship with God? Who has that authority? The authority uh, to tell us how we could get saved and to tell us how we can relate to God. Who has the authority to say whether or not we will or won't spend uh, eternity in heaven or hell? Um, who can uh, determine right and wrong for us? Who can um, decide whether we should uh, do this or do that? How do, we, uh, how do we find this truth? And there's a couple different ways. Either it's from a man. Either we're going to the, the Pope or a, uh, or a uh, bishop or we're going to a preacher, um, which unfortunately is all too often the truth. And if, if that's what we're doing to gain the truth, then the truth changes. If the truth changes, was it the truth? Um, it's my understanding that the Catholic Church 
changed their theology on purgatory uh, not too awfully long ago. Um, they also came up with a revised version of the Bible recently. Uh, during the Lutheran Revolution, they were selling um, s sins to people, uh, tokens, so that you could sin. Um, they, they were selling the, we're talking about the Lutheran Reformation, and they were selling indulgences, they called them. And it was basically a sin ticket. You buy an indulgence, and let's say, uh, you know, I like getting, okay, I don't, but let's say for, for argument's sake, I like getting wasted on Friday night and visiting the brothel, which is common in the air. So uh, you go to the local priest because they're building the Sistine Chapel and, and they need the money and you go, listen, I want to get wasted this weekend and go to a brothel, but if I get killed in the carriage on the way home, I don't want to spend eternity in hell. So I need to get absolved of these sins now. What can we do about that? And the priest says, sure, for uh, $50, I'm going to sell you an indulgence and then you're going to be cured of this sin uh, before you commit it so that even if you die in the act of fornicating and drunkenness, then you're all paid up. Well, it's ridiculous. Uh, the uh, Half of the church thought it was ridiculous, um, but it was sanctioned by the Pope. Was the Pope infallible, or did he make a mistake? If he made a mistake, is our authority okay to be vested in a man that can make a mistake like that? Is it okay for the priest and the, the Jesuits and the different the men that were there is it okay for them to make a mistake? Uh, Luther and some of the others in um, Germany stood up and said, this is ridiculous. We're not going to follow that. And they were claimed to be heretics by the church. So is it okay for a church that would call a man that would stand against the selling of indulgences a heretic? Are they our final authority? Or do we have a different final authority? Is the Bible the authority? If the Bible is the authority, then we can turn to the Bible and see what it has to say. Now, if our authority is our feelings and our emotions, then whose a feeling is right? If you have a feeling of a visit from Mary and, uh, and you get the warm and fuzzies from it, um, I'm not going to gainsay your feelings. I'm not going to say that you didn't have a warm and fuzzy feeling. I'm not going to say you didn't have a spiritual event take place. I wasn't there, you were. I'm not going to argue with it because I can't, because the authority for that emotional feeling is yours and yours solely, yours alone. I can't argue with what you feel. If you tell me that you love a cedar tree, and I tell you that's ridiculous, you can't love a cedar tree, and you go, no, I, I absolutely love a cedar tree and want to marry it, I can't argue with the, your infatuation and love towards the tree Beyond the fact that, okay, I, I think that's kind of stupid, but it's yours, it's not mine. So I'm not going to argue about what you felt or why. <laughs> but if your authority is based in the Word of God as, as opposed to your feelings, then we have something to argue about, to look at. And if it's just your feelings, then whose feelings do we go by? If you feel that and somebody else feels that they get a, a rush of emotion of, of, uh, of purity whenever they kill Christians, are they right? If, the, if, if some radical Islamists, some, some purist Islamists come together and say, uh, you know, the, the, the world at large, the Christians at large, the Western world, they need to die. And they get pumped up about it. They feel good about it. They get a visit from Muhammad. Do we give credence to that? Is that true because they get that feeling? Because they do get that feeling, as Greg pointed out. Our Mormons, our Jehovah's Witness, um, or anybody else. Uh, you get a, a, a good Baptist preacher that has a dream and starts controlling the church or the, the people, the congregation, and starts making decisions based on a dream that they've had. What's the authority there? Who makes the decision on that? What if you have a dream that, that China is going to attack California? Can you then base your life and your opinions, your thing, on this vision? Or is there a greater authority than you? 
as long as your vision doesn't step outside of the bounds of the Word of God. If you have a vision that you want to buy a Ford and not a Chevrolet, keep it to yourself and buy a Ford. As long as it has nothing to do, it doesn't interfere with the free reign and the truth of the Word of God. But consider it an emotional um, high and don't consider it truth from God. Unless you believe that that is truth from God. And if you believe that, that the truth is revealed to you in dream state, in um, voodoo, or in a smoke-filled hut, um, if you believe it's revealed to you from your spirit animal, or there's all kinds of different ways that people have this emotional experience, then that's got to be your final authority, and you'll take that authority to heaven with you. And when you stand temporarily in heaven before the white throne, and God says, this is my word, what do you do about it? And you say, well, man, I had a feeling. You know, I had a feeling that, that my spirit animal, the wolf, told me that I should uh, be, uh, you know, dance around a, this pole and, and uh, do, well, you know what? Your feeling's going to spend get you an eternity in the lake of fire. Your feelings aren't relevant to the truth. The truth is what I laid down, not what you laid down. The truth is what I wrote in my word. So it's a question of authority. Whose authority can you stack your life on? A priest, your emotions, or the word of God? Now, I wouldn't give a long answer like that to a friend, close friend, or a uh, unless it was uh, an open conversation, but I, I would I'd be careful not to run somebody off. But I just want to point out that it's a question of authority, and if if then we're going to talk about what authority, then we can talk about the Word of God and what is authority and and who is it, and then from there that's the foundation of our faith, understanding that God is true, and from there then we can move into. Uh, Mary being the mother of God, but the mother of Christ, but not the mother of God. The mother of the man, but not the mother of the God. And so um, she is a, uh, and as Greg so aptly put, in need of a Savior as well. Okay, uh, if you guys have any questions on that, um, if you have any more uh, comments to add to that, email us or... or uh, do the instant message thing to Jarrett back here um, and let us know if you have, if we didn't answer something or you want it answered more fully, uh, email us or write to us and we'll try to do that. Greg, do you have anything else that you want to add before we uh, jump into chapter four here? Uh, I, I just noticed on the chat room, Nate, that uh, some are asking about the Holy Spirit and feelings. And, um, I made a comment on there, feelings are natural, God has feelings, but our feelings can be easily deceived. And then I also said that I bet in the upper room their feelings were deeply moved by the Holy Spirit. Feelings are completely natural. If you see God in the Old Testament when he got angry, when he got angry at the Israelites and you see his emotion, um, you know, when, when he said that he was going to destroy the earth, it says that, that he grieved in his heart. When he looked at man, so he had deep grief in his heart. Um, you know, God is, it brings God joy and pleasure. When, when, when Noah got off the ark and, and, and offered the animal sacrifices to God, it brought God so much joy. And God said, I'm never going to again curse the earth uh, uh, because of man in this fashion. And so emotions are, are God-given. They're wonderful. I'm glad that we have emotions but we have to be careful because they can be deceived easily. Yeah, the, uh, the, like I said, I would not gainsay. I'm not going to come into a church and say, you don't feel the Holy Spirit. You feel uh, euphoric because you had too much caffeine. I'm not going to say that because it's not my authority. I don't need to. I don't actually care whether it's caffeine or the Holy Spirit, in a broader sense. It doesn't affect what the Word of it doesn't affect truth. If you come in and you rearrange the Bible to be based on your feelings, 
then you're not worshiping God in truth. You're worshiping in emotion. And never are we commanded to or asked to worship God that way. We're commanded to worship Him in spirit and in truth, and we're going to look at that tonight. But that's different than um, jumping up and down and, and hee-hawing. And there's some interesting things uh, about the uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, if you watch some of the modern uh, evangelists or preachers that run around and they fill people with the Holy Spirit, you'll notice that people get tapped on the forehead and they fall backwards. Never, ever in the Bible does the Spirit of God ever cause someone to fall on their back. Never does it happen. Always on their face. Always towards God, always on their face. It never happens on their back. Um, if you see somebody get slain in the Spirit and they hit their back, they're not slain in the Holy Spirit. They're slain in a different spirit. Uh, always, and when you come to God, you come to God on your face and not, not on your back. It's a different, uh, completely different spirit there. Um, look it up, and, and, you'll, and you'll see the, the truth of that. Okay, now I'm going to get into chapter 4 here just a little bit, and I want to, uh, as, as we get into this, Jesus comes to a certain area, and I want to take a five-minute break, and there's a, a, a download that we get sent for you that's got just a few passages. Go over those passages. It, it won't take the full five minutes, but spend some time going over those passages and then check out the map that we have and familiarize yourself with where this is with the map on that, on that PDF. Okay, so we come down to um, Jesus has finished his conversation with Nicodemus. He goes to Judea, close to Jerusalem somewhere, down in the southern part of Israel. And uh, it says uh, when he gets down there, he, he starts ministering to people. We see some of it in the other Gospels, but in the Synoptic Gospels. But here in John, it says, verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Um, now, Jesus was down in, uh, in Judea, and they were baptizing people uh, into the ministry of Christ. And uh, when the Pharisees heard it, it says, The Lord knew how the Pharisees... Now, who is this Lord? It's capital L. So it's God. When God knew how the Pharisees heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, it says, He, still talking about the Lord left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So, once again, we have a claim to the deity of Christ. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now, Samaria, there, there was two different routes, basic routes that you could take. The reason for that is the rugged terrain. If you go too far to the east, you can't get through those, those mountains. And if you go between the Jordan River and, um, and the road that goes over Samaria... Uh, you can't, um, it, it's real rough terrain. So even today, if you take a bus, which I've done, from the Galilee area down to Jerusalem, you go over through either the Dead Sea, I mean down the, the um, Jordan River, or you go back up around the mountains on the other side. You go one, one side or the other, because that's where the big roads are. So... Um, Jesus had those two routes, but the, the spirit or the destination that they needed to go, they needed to go through Samaria. Uh, Sam, um, Samaria. It says in verse 5, Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called uh, Sychar, I guess, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now this parcel of ground is, is very important and relevant to what we're going to get into tonight. And I want to take a few minutes, I want you to get in your Bibles, and, and look at these passages that I've got. I've got, if you haven't downloaded it, Genesis 33, 17 through 20. Again, in Genesis 48, 20 through 22. And then in uh, Joshua 24, verse 31 through 33. And all these passages are dealing with this particular parcel of land. So I want to take five minutes now. Uh, look at these passages, look at what's around them, and then familiarize yourself with the map, and we will be back in five.
And welcome back. Now, if you got into those passages, I hope you looked at a little bit more of the passage at large and see uh, the importance that the Sumerians would have put on this particular plot of land. It's also close to the area where um, Abraham would have offered Isaac or attempted to offer Isaac. It would have been up in the same mountain range close to that. So this was a very prominent place of worship for them. This was a place that that Jacob got uh, met Esau, and and uh, the the promised seed was separated from the false seed. It was the place to where uh, God told Jacob, "Go back to that place and build an altar to me." It was a place where he dug the well, and it was so. It's been a very important parcel of land for the Jews for uh, a good one and a half millennium at this point, just about. Um, so from the very beginning, from the very foundation of their nation, this has been an important piece of property. Now, Jesus is walking through the, uh, through the, uh, the, the, the Samaria here, and he comes to this, uh, this place. And it says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now Jesus is a man. He was tired. Uh, it, it says in the in the New Testament that um, the the sign of the Antichrist will be to deny that Jesus came in the flesh. They'll say he came only in spirit form, or he came only as as the deity and not as a man. And this is one of those times that says, "Hey, Jesus was tired. He was wearied. His flesh was tired. Um, so he was tired from his journey. He had been walking, had been dragging on him. It had been a, a long trip. So he sits down there next to the well." And there cometh the woman of Samaria to, to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now, the Samarians were a mix of Syrians and Jews that uh, were considered beneath the Gentiles. They were, uh, in, the, in the preceding three centuries, as Israel was inundated with, with uh false doctrines from, with uh, f false gods and with nations that destroyed them, um, some of the Jews took to themselves husbands or wives, spouses, family, and, uh, uh, and gathered some of their customs, some of the things that they did, and uh, their bloodlines got mixed with these Gentiles. And it was something that was God told them not to do. They weren't allowed into certain parts of the temple. And... Uh, they were considered uh, the worst dregs of the society. They were, uh, as a matter of fact, in uh, 66 A.D., about 30 years after this took place, the Jews, the, the rabbinical Jews, created a new law that said that Sumerian women were uh, were constantly unclean. When a Jewish woman would would have her cycle once a month, she was considered unclean for seven days. And they determined that Sumerian women were uh, constantly unclean, that, that they were always to not be touched or moved, or, and that if a man were to, to uh, talk, uh, touch or shake hands with a Sumerian woman, then uh, he would be unclean for uh, seven days. He couldn't go in the temple or worship or do anything like that. So the Jews felt very strongly about this. And furthermore, in the society, you would not have... Uh, a stranger, a strange man would not talk to a woman he didn't know. You wouldn't go into town and meet a woman at the well and strike up a conversation. It'd be very forward and not, uh, and, and not culturally acceptable. For a Jew in good standing to talk to a Samaritan woman, was uh, he was abasing himself to a large degree. It wasn't... It wasn't uh, it wasn't lascivious, uh, improper, but it was um, it was like walking around with manure spread all over you, improper. It was very um, debasing in in their minds, and you see it from the disciples' uh, reaction to it later. But uh, he sets down next to the well, and there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her. Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto it, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, Jesus obviously knows what's in this woman's heart. He obviously is here to have this conversation. And uh, he's sitting at the well, and she shows up. And it seems like a, a huge leap in the conversation. He says, give me something to drink. And she goes, and, and proprietally so, uh, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. And he goes, if you knew who I was, you would ask me, and I'd give you living water. And, uh, and, sh and the woman saith, thou hast nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Now this is a bit of an insult, because the Samaritans carried, uh, they, they used the, the first five books, the books of Moses, as the law, but they disregarded all the other works, and they said only these five books are the book of the law, and they were waiting on the Messiah that would come uh, according to Genesis, where Moses said there would be one that would come up like uh, one of the brethren that would... And so they were waiting for a Moses-like Messiah to come and deliver them. And uh, they didn't uh, listen to Isaiah or Psalms or any of the other prophets that we see. So uh, when she says, are you greater than Jacob, she is, um, she is pointing out obnoxiously so that uh, that she uh, upholds Jacob and those in and, and those dealings more than any of the other prophets and uh, and so she says are you greater than uh, than Jacob who gave us the Samaritans uh, and his children and his cattle to drink from this well and Jesus answered it and said unto her whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be unto him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Now, um, I want to look at the parallels of this. Greg, if you want to jump in here at any time, um, there, are, there are a few things, and I'm kind of intending to come back to some of this, but, but if you want to jump in, just go ahead. Do you have something you want to jump in right now? No, you're doing. I'm enjoying the story right now. <laughs> okay, the um, that's quite a compliment coming from Greg because he is a master storyteller. Um, okay, so um, Jesus is is talking to the woman, and when he comes up and he says to give me drink, and she says, "Why are you talking to me?" And he says, "If you had asked, I would give you living water." I, I look back in the Bible at at the water and how it is talked about through the Scripture, and it's the way it cleanses, the way it's used in purification. Uh, Moses striking the rock and water coming out, or speaking to the rock and water coming out. And so I want to go over just a couple of those, and if, it's, if you're interested and you have time, it only appears some 600 times. Just go through it and look at um, most of the Bible. The... Uh, Okay, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 11. It says, The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. It, it relates the words of a righteous man to a well of life, to a clean, pure well of water. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 4. The words of a man's mouth are as deep water, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. So it relates here, the words of a man's mouth to deep, to a deep pool, to a lake, to something that's pure and, and cold and clear, and the fountains of living water uh, are, are uh, the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. Uh, a, the words of a man's mouth that are wise are like a flowing brook. It says in uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, and it's part of a larger, larger uh, condemnation. He's talking to uh, about the children of Israel getting caught up in idolatry, and he says, "For my people have committed two evils; they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, 
and hath hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. God says, I am the fountain of living water, and they've forsaken me. And they've hewn out cisterns. They've done two evils. The children of Israel did two evils. The first evil that they did was they forsook God. They forsook the words of God. They turned away from Him, and they didn't listen to Him. They didn't consider them. They didn't study the words of God, and, and they, they ignored Him. Now you say, no, they, what they did was they, they forgot the commandments of God, the words of God. The commandments of God are the words of God, the law of God. Look at the word, look at the through the Bible at word, words. It's all it's often, often connected with the law. The words and the law are, are off the word of righteousness, the word of grace, and the word of the law. It's often connected. So the first evil that they did was they forsook the word, they forsook the fountain of living water. God. The second evil that they did was they hewed themselves out cisterns. Now this isn't living water. This isn't moving, clear, crystal water that would come from God. If you came from God, it would be flowing, it would be pure, it would be regenerating. Instead, they hewed out cisterns, these bowls that they were going to fill with the stagnant water. But not only did it not work, the bowls had holes in them and the water ran out. They didn't even get any water, not even stagnant water. And what he's talking about is the children of Israel forsaking the law of God and then embracing idolatry. And then God sent them into captivity. So that's just a couple examples of seeing that, that water is often talked about as the word or the law or the, the body of God. Now often you cannot separate Jesus, the word, capital W, and the words, the Bible, because they're one and the same. Jesus is the truth. The word of truth, Jesus is the truth. They're inexorably connected. You can't separate, and especially here. Okay, another one, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Very well-known passage. It's talking about the love of God in, in relation to a husband. It says uh, that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The church is cleansed with the washing of water by the word. The water is the word that cleans the church, that cleanses it, that presents it, that it says that he might present to himself a bride without spot and blemish. How? The word. So, as we come here, when Jesus offers, and, he, and she says, give me a drink, and he says, if you knew who was asking, I would give you living water. The water that he can give her is the words of life. It's the words of truth. It is the salvation of God. He's going to offer her these words. And he says, if you'd take them, you'd never thirst again. And she says, And the woman saith unto him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? And drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall never thirst again. He points to himself. Whosoever drinketh of this water that I'm giving you, that I'm offering you, won't ever thirst again. And she goes, what are you talking about? And he says, But whosoever drinketh of that water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be unto him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, do you see how this passage takes shape if you understand that the water that he's talking about is the word of truth? It is the, the life of God, the life of Christ. And if, if the word is delivered unto you that Jesus saves, if the word is delivered unto you that the Son of Man was lifted up, John says that I'm writing these things that you might believe that he is the Christ and that believing you might have life eternal through his name, if you understand that, when you receive the word, it comes into you, it creates fruit. The fruit that it is, is more words. You take that same word and it flows out of you to other people. It flows out of you and you tell others about what Jesus has done. And it's a well of living water that springs forth from you. It comes out of you and it's infectious. 
it grows. It gets it to other people. And so he says, if you would, would receive it, then I'd give you living water. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, no, that's back. Let me get back down. Okay. And so verse 13, he says, And Jesus answered and said, Whosoever drinketh shall never thirst again. And whosoever drinketh of the water I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water I shall give him shall be a well springing up unto everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not. Neither come hither to draw. Now, here is a convert that you're not interested in. Greg talked about somebody that you don't preach to. This is that attitude. Sir, I can tell you about a man that will, that will save your soul, that will regenerate you, that will create in you a new life, and that you will have eternal life and spend eternity with God. Well, tell me about him, because I want to I spend an eternity with, in paradise. I want to have streets of gold and a, a gate of diamonds, and I, I want the rewards. Okay, but he'll create a clean heart in you. I'm not really interested in that. I just I want blessings. I want to be blessed on this earth and I want to have eternal life. I just that's all I want. I want you to leave me alone with all the religious stuff. I just want to have eternal life. Uh okay, go get your friends and bring them back. I'll tell them about it. Cuz you know what? You're not you're not who I'm trying to talk to. Because you're interested in not being thirsty, physically thirsty, but you're not interested in the word of truth. You're not interested in, in being a spring of this, of this water that will flow out and, and that you could never thirst again if you drank. So he says, go get your husband. And uh, he says in verse 16, go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thine husband, in that thou saidest truly. So the woman's going to kind of blow him off. Just She's like, go get your husband. No, nah, I don't have a husband. You're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. The guy you're living with isn't your husband. Woo, how'd you know that? So now she's listening. Now he's proved through this message that he has... A knowledge outside of the physical realm. He has a, a supernatural knowledge of this woman. So it gets her attention. And the woman said unto her, said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So because he had the supernatural knowledge, he goes, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Let's see what her attitude is. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, we talked about this at the very beginning of this, this passage. As soon as people are faced with a choice to love God, to choose God, or to go their own way, they love straw men. One of the passages that I've heard, or the passages, one of the excuses that I've heard a lot, the church is full of heretics. I worked with a guy that was a drunk, drug addict, um, in, in, a, in a bad way, pathetically poor, holes in the wall, um, rough-looking character. And uh, I, I started witnessing to him because he's working by the hour, so he had to sit there and listen. So I, I started witnessing to him. And, and the first thing he goes is, hey, the church is full of heretics. Yeah. Keep witnessing to him. Tell him about Jesus. Well, I went, I, you know, I, I knew some people that went to church. I went to church one time. He said, I, there was people down there that they would, uh, I'd see them in the bar, and then they'd go to church and act like they're all better than me. Yep, church is full of heretics. Church is full of sinners, full of people trying to act like they're one thing when they're something else. Let me tell you about Jesus. Whoa. <laughs> Well, well, you know, I, well, why aren't you defending the church? <laughs> why aren't you telling me that, that, that it's not full of heretics? Because I don't really care about that. Hypocrites. Or, uh, full of, uh, yeah, hypocrites, thank you. Yeah, the church is full of hypocrites. I don't really care if the church is full of hypocrites. 
I'm not interested in defending a church that I've never been to or congregation that I've never seen. Because the chances are you've never seen it either. That's just something you've heard, and it's a defense that you're using to not have to talk about God and about your need before God. But I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not interested in being drawn into that conversation. I'm going to tell you about what Christ has done for you, and you're going to make a decision whether you like it or not, because I'm about to tell you, and you're going to decide one way or the other when you hear it, whether you're going to love God or not, whether you're going to serve God or not. And when you make that decision then you'll be justly damned or you'll be justly saved. That's up to you. But I'm going to tell you one way or the other. So she throws out this straw man. She says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that Jerusalem is the place men ought worship. Now Jesus hasn't said that. That hasn't been part of the whole conversation. But she's going to throw this out because she wants to argue with him about it. That's their favorite argument. Because this, this place, this particular place, is so important to him. Now, the interesting thing is that when Jesus comes to the well, what the woman is there to get is she's coming to pull this water out of this place of worship. It's their place that they've built, that they've considered, that they're uh, all about. It's their place of worship. And they want to come and draw water out of that place that they're going to worship. And Jesus says, that water, that's man's words. That's that's temporal. That's not the real stuff. I'm the real stuff. And I want to give you a word. I want to give you water that you can drink and never thirst again. But she's more interested in this place that she's got, in this place of worship that she has. She's not interested in the... uh, in the message that he has, that he has everlasting water. And so he says, she says, she brings this up, and Jesus says, Jesus said unto her in 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship what ye know not. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, I have downloaded a, uh, a lot of the passages in the Bible that deal with uh, worship, that talk about worship. Um, I'm pushed for time, so I'm going to keep going tonight, but what I want you to do is, is when we go through this, go back and look at the word worship. What it, what it is, what worship is, and what it isn't. And uh, I'm going to summarize it, but don't take my summary. Go back and look at worship. Worship, it says when, uh, when Jesus came to... Uh, came across the, the river, um, I mean, cr- come across this, the Sea of Galilee, and he came unto the Gadareans. This, this man that was possessed of these devils of the legion came to Jesus, and in one, one of the Gospels it says that f- he fell down at Jesus' feet and cried and said, Thou art the Son of the Most High, art thou come to torment me before my time? And another Gospel says he came and he worshipped Jesus. So what did he do? He fell down on his face, and he declared that Jesus was who he was. He gave him. He didn't. He didn't praise. He didn't sing. He didn't beat a tambourine. He didn't dance. He simply said, "You're God. You're you're God." And he was on his face when he said it. That's worship. Jesus said, "Don't worship false gods." When the de- when the the devil came before Jesus and he said, "Just fall down." Kneel before me, worship me. Jesus said, uh, no. He said, they shall have no other gods before me. So I won't do it. I won't kneel down before you. When, uh, if we look at, I'll tell you what, I want to look at one passage in particular. Turn with me to First Chronicles. As I looked at the word worship, I thought that this, this passage was uh, more... Um, had more in it about worship. It had a very clear definition of worship in this passage. 
First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 27, start in verse 27. It says, glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Here's worship. Come before God and declare that he is who he is. Give unto the Lord glory, do his name. That's worship. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth, that's worship. Say it, the Lord reigneth, that's worship. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice in all that, uh, all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the woods sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. The trees worship. When the trees' leaves move, they worship God, because it declares, it says in Romans, the handiwork of God. The ocean worships. When the ocean moves before God, because it gives God its due. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. And, and say ye, save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather us together. Deliver us from the heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name, in, in glory in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel forever and ever. And the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Worship is acknowledging God, acknowledging who he is and what he is, and the authority that he has and what he's done, it's, it's acknowledging God. We've made worship something that we, we have worship service. We bang a tambourine or depends on what affiliation, bang a set of drums, blow on a trumpet, jam a guitar. Now we're worshiping God. You worship God in holiness. You worship God by walking in holiness that worships God. How? Because you're saying that God created me to be this way and He's worthy of me walking the way He created me to be. That worships God. Worship God when you walk outside and you see the sunrise and declare His handiwork. Declare that He is the creator of all. That worships God. When you see somebody walking down the street and you say, Hey, Jesus died and saved my, my soul. You worship God. You worship Him because you're declaring that He is who He says He is. That worships God. So she says to, to Jesus, she said, you say we ought to worship in Jerusalem. But this is where, this is where uh, our, our father Jacob, he worshiped right here. As a matter of fact, God told him to come over here and build an altar. So he came here and he worshiped God right here in this plot of land. But you say I ought to go to Jerusalem and worship. Jesus says no. He said the hour cometh. When shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the father? Ye worship what ye know. We were. Uh, ye worship what ye know. What ye know. Ye worship. Ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. So you worship God now, not in a physical way. The hour is coming when you don't worship God by going to the temple with a sacrifice and cutting it open. You don't, you don't physically do it that way. The hour is coming when I, where you don't march over here or march over there to worship God, where you don't do these things, these particular things to worship God. The hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. You worship God by declaring who He is and accepting Him as your Savior, and you worship God by doing, accepting, understanding the truth. You worship God in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, how is this different? The Jews worship God, and if they brought a sacrifice to the temple and killed the lamb and offered it, it, it was irrelevant their feelings at the time. It was irrelevant their spirit at the time. They were worshiping in a physical manner that they were told to worship. The way that they felt or the way that they uh, perceived God was not as relevant 
as was their actions towards God, their, their physical things that they had to do. The hour is coming and now is when it's going to be relevant what your actions towards God are and what your spirit towards God is. Worship the Lord in spirit and truth for God's a spirit and, he's, and they that worship Him must worship Him not just in a physical way, but in spirit and in truth. Now, what is truth? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. Now that's just a little passage, but there's truth. By the word of truth, the scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him, that ye have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. The truth that we worship God by is in Jesus, and it is in the Word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, for he seeketh such to worship him. Worship God by opening your Bible and reading it. Do you see that? You worship the Lord in truth? Worship God by acknowledging that He wrote the Word of God, that He protected it, that, he, that He's preserved it pure and totally and holy. Worship God by, by believing that, by opening it, by reading it, by expounding on it, by, by living your life by it. You worship God in truth. Worship God in spirit. Don't just open it and read it. That'd be in truth. But open it and read it and, and be, believe it and be changed by it. Enjoy it. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. For He seeketh such to worship Him. All right. Um, the, uh, Greg, do you have anything you want to add before we get into the next part of the story. I mean, there's a whole lot that we could talk about with this spirit and truth, but just a little story. My um, last Sunday, my wife and I put on some music, and, and on Sunday morning we were just uh, singing some songs to the Lord, and we had our kids around there in the living room. And uh, I was, you know, I was singing to God. We were singing, you know, about uh, what Christ has done on the cross, and, and uh, I looked over at my my son. He's uh, seven years old. And I looked over at my daughter. She's six years old. And, and I saw them. They were mimicking me. So they were they were kind of looking at me. And they saw me with uh, my eyes closed. And they saw me singing to the Lord. And I could see them. And they're kind of opening their eyes once in a while. And they look at me to see how how I'm singing to God. And they and then they close their eyes. And they're they're trying to sing. And I and and uh, and we were. You know, I got down on my knees at one point because one of the songs sang about getting on our being on our knees before God. So I got on my knees, and, and the kids, they look at me, and right away they got down on their knees. And it's easy for kids to follow the physical motions of their parents, and, and I don't have a problem with them doing that. But it's dangerous when those, when my, if, if my kids are allowed to think that that is real worship when they mimic me. When they mimic me with their physical, they mimic my physical actions. That's dangerous, because I don't want them to grow up and be mimicking all the right motions, but inside their heart doesn't know what the words mean, and their heart doesn't know who they're singing to, and they don't truly, in their spirit, know God. And so, it's vital for me as a father, and I and I didn't do this last Sunday, but. I was just thinking about it as we're going through this verse. I was thinking about going back and sitting down with JJ and talking to him about this verse and just saying uh, to, to my children, you know, in your spirit is where you worship God. It's not these outward motions of hands raised and on our knees with our eyes closed, uh, having the right somber expression on our face. That, that's not worship. It's something that is inside of you that's in your spirit that you worship God inside of your spirit because you know that Jesus is the truth. 
and you know that God has made you, and you know the, the truth that we've learned from God's word, and we, we, see, uh, we see God's creation around us, and it, and it causes us inside our spirit to worship God. So it's just encouraging me to, um, to go back and, and review this scripture with my kids. Yeah, and uh, that's a, uh, a perfect illustration of how this changed from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Whereas in, in this time, you go to Jerusalem and worship God, and going through those motions was what you were supposed to do. Um, but now you can go through the motions, and, and even then they were ineffective. If you look at the, what happened with the Pharisees, they went through all the motions, but it wasn't in their spirit. It was just something that was physically manifested. They just they, they kept the Ten Commandments and the 600 and whatever, 27 little laws, but, but, it wasn't, uh, but the laws were what was important to them, not the spirit behind the laws. And, and that's where it became dead. It became something that wasn't alive. And that's where he says, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Now, uh, this next part of the story is what every missionary wants to see. This is what, this is what every evangelist wants to see. Is you want to see that, that, that fulcrum person. You want to reach that person that's so loud and so obnoxious and so wonderfully on fire that they drop what they're doing, they run back to their village, and they tell everybody about the Messiah. I've seen the Christ. This is what he's done for me. This is who he is. I've seen the Christ. Let me tell you about him. And so this next part of the story, and I think I'll let Greg tell this one, but this next part of the story is, is such a, uh, it's the reason that, that Christ was here. It's the reason that he talked to her. And uh, the, the reaction that he has to this, the, the, the emotion that comes from him, the moving of his spirit that comes from him is what, is what we do it for. It's what the evangelists are out there for. It's what the preachers all want is to reach that person that does this. So, Greg, you ready? Go ahead and tell, tell the story if you would. I'm getting hoarse. Um, so in verse 25, the uh, woman hears what Jesus says, and she responds to it. She says, I know that the Messiah is going to come, who is called the Christ. When he's come, he's going to tell us all things. Now, he, Jesus had just told her, something amazing he told her about that she had five husbands and how could he know that and so she's putting two and two together and she says well i know the messiah is coming and he's going to tell us all things and I, I i think she was probably looking at jesus like no is it possible <laughs> and jesus responds to her and he says i that speak to thee am he and her face must have just been in shock that here in front of her was the Messiah, the Christ. And uh, her disi the disciples come, and the, the, it says in verse 20, says, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? So the disciples come, and they see Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman and they're, they're kind of, they're shocked. And they look at him and they're embarrassed a little bit and nobody wants to say, why is he talking to the woman? Because it's such an embarrassing thing that Jesus is talking to the Samaritan. And, and they, they they look at Jesus and they look at the Samaritan. And all of a sudden the Samaritan woman, she drops her pot and I bet water splashed all over and it created quite a scene and she just took off running. And the disciples are looking at the they're looking at Jesus, and he looks tired. And they're looking at this woman. She drops her pot with water spraying all over, and and she takes off running. And and the disciples are wondering what is going on. <laughs> and it says, uh, it says the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men. So she runs into her city. She sees all the men. A lot of times in, in these days, the, 
the men, they would stand around the, the city of the gate, and that's where they would talk about things. And she ran into the gate of the city, and she says to the men around her, Come see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is not this Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So this woman runs out, and she's an evangelist. Now my daughter, Elizabeth, she's six years old. And for a while now, she's told me, Daddy, when I grew up, I want to tell people about Jesus. And I tell her every time I hear that, I say, that's wonderful, Elizabeth. I'm so excited that you want to tell people about Jesus. And the woman at the well is one woman that I can hold up as an example to my daughter. I could say, Elizabeth, the woman at the well, she was a woman that was despised and rejected because she was a Samaritan. But when she met Jesus, she was so excited that she left her water pot behind and she ran and she told all the men, she told everybody, I met Jesus. And she told them her testimony. And so girls, woman, here is a, a wonderful example of an evangelist, a powerful evangelist who ran out and told people her testimony of what Jesus had done in her life. And I, and I hope that my daughter Elizabeth grows up to be an evangelist like, like the woman at the well. Let's keep reading. It says, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. I already read that. In verse 31, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him out to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Now what I, what I love about that is, uh, Nate, you could probably agree to this. When I've told somebody about Jesus, and I've seen them respond with face like the Samaritan woman had when she believed that Jesus was the Christ. When I've told someone about Jesus and they've responded with that shock and excitement that Jesus is the Christ and they believe what I said, you know what? I wasn't hungry. I had meat that nobody knew of. And that meat, <laughs> I was so excited. Uh, I just I got one person's face in my mind right now that... That, that I told her about Jesus in an hour and a half. I, I went through the whole Bible. I went through a bunch of verses with her. She came from, with no religious background. And I told her about Jesus. And when I finished, she looked, she had this face. She looked and she, her eyes welled up with tears. And she said, God died for me. And she just started weeping because she was so excited that God died for her. And, and uh, when I saw that, it, 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 it fed me. <laughs> and so Jesus has meat that nobody knows of. And he said, that meat is to do the will of my father. And then he, and he talks about laboring and reaping the harvest. He finishes, the, the, this part finishes up here. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Praise God. Amen. The, uh, like... This is what this is what every preacher, every evangelist wants to see. They want to see um, this one person to go out and and proclaim the truth, and for other people to get a hold of the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Most High God, 
that he's, that he's saved me, that he's washed me from my sins, and get a hold of that and forget about the preacher. Forget about the one that told them. Forget about the, uh, the denomination that they came from. And instead, be excited about Christ. Be excited about God. Be excited about his word and what, what he's done and, uh, and the truth that he gives. Now, um, before we get into uh, the rest of this, I think we're out of time for the week. So next week we'll pick up in, uh, in verse 43 where it continues with, um, with the, the story of, of Christ healing somebody as he goes back into Galilee. Um, there's a few things in that that we probably want to take a little bit of time with. So we'll, we'll wait and pick that up next week. Now, um, we have a, a phone number now that you can call. And uh, next week we're going to be getting into chapter 5. Uh, Jesus comes to a well, and, uh, and there's a man that has been crippled a long time, and Jesus heals him. And, uh, and when he heals the man, he says, take up your bed and walk. Go home with it. Well, it was the, the, the thing that Jesus told him to do was in opposition of the law, or it was against, it seems like it was against the Mosaic law. He's working, he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath. And this angers the Jews that this man's doing that. Well, here's my question to you. I'm going to ask you to contend for your faith a little bit with me. You see the phone number on the screen. Call this week and and answer. Tell you're leaving a message. It's just it's just a message. You're not going to talk to anybody, and and nobody's going to grill you. Um, but but leave a succinct message, or you can email us either one, and and let me know what you think, why Jesus told the guy to carry his bed on the Sabbath, and was it lawful for the man to do that? Short and to the point. Be short and to the point, Jarrett says. <laughs> and uh, and, and how, are, how is it that the Sabbath is, uh, um, how is it that Jesus is relating to the Sabbath here? So go ahead and, and consider that. And the reason that I like you to do that is because what I want to see happen is I want you to read the passage that we're going to be in next week. Study it a little bit. Figure some things out for yourself. Enjoy it. And when we get here next week, you'll have already looked at it, studied it, considered it. And, uh, and we're going to be doing a Bible study together. Now, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. This is not a show for your entertainment. We are not here... Um, it says in one place, it says they've heaped teachers unto themselves having itching ears. Um, I don't want to be in a heap of teachers. Um, what I want to do is to deliver to you a method of systematic study and a, a um, example of, of how believing the Word of God unapologetically and completely, is not an incongruous, it's not simple-minded, and it's, it's not uh, difficult to learn to study the Word of God. I want to deliver that to you so that you can then study the Word of God and learn for yourself. So get into it this next week and, and try to answer that question, why does Jesus tell him to carry his bed on the Sabbath, and, uh, and what is the... Uh, what is the, the relationship that Christ has with the Sabbath there, and, and why does this uh, seem incongruous with the law? All right, any housekeeping notes, Jarrett? Anything else from you, Greg? Bye. 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 Thank you for joining us tonight, and until next week, remember to contend for your faith.